Master Tavern Keepers, History of the Old World. So, before arriving at the great pillar of Og Agog at the Midsummer Throng, where had you been? You said you were traveling south along something you called the Lost Road. Ah, oh, yes, that's right. We had just left the morass of permanent tents, sod huts, and other such dwellings that make up the largest settlement in all of Albion, Bola Hat, just to the north of the pillar. We'd also had a run in with a uh, Bollocks, and the mercenary giant known as a Markle Grimmock. What? The Markle Grimmock? He of the tragedy of Macdeath fame? He's real? He most certainly is, and a most nefarious troublemaker to boot. Oh, please, tell us more. As you know, it is my favourite play. Ach, of that fact I'm most aware. But uh, first a little bit about Bowl the Hat, methinks. Now, this sprawling settlement has the greatest density of people in all of Albion, but it's not dissimilar in nature to the tent city that has spontaneously sprung up to surround the games at the Pillar of Og Agog. But whereas that was uh, temporary, existing just whilst the festivities were being held, the tent city of Bowl the Hat is a permanent feature and a very different beast. Something like a, a cross between a city and the scene after some kind of natural disaster. Now, across most of the island, the people still dwell in caves, but before you start conjuring up images of near-naked primitives, huddled around the barely burning fire, picking grubs and lice out of each other's hair, it's not like that. And there are some very good reasons why we still live in caves. Albion has become an extremely dank, damp and dangerous place, as we touched on earlier. For on vast tracts of Albion, there is little solid land, apart from the uh, rocky crags that sit like islands between large stretches of peat bogs and wet fens. This is far from ideal terrain for extensive building projects, let me tell you. That doesn't mean it hasn't been attempted, but does mean that they always end the same way. Collapsed, half-buried ruins, swallowed up by some uh, swamp and overgrown by vicious plants. Now as you know, man craves safety above all other things and this means that, uh, well, inevitably it's led the tribes of Albion back to the traditional and extensive cave systems of our ancestors. And the caves are just not big holes in a pile of rocks. They are beautiful and fine living spaces. Millennia of habitation has made the floor smooth. The walls are intricately carved with knotwork, paintings and carvings. Luxurious animal skins and tapestries line the floors and walls. And in the most ancient, sturdy doors, impenetrable gates and unbreakable portcullises protect their entrances. But what of the castles and other structures described in the tragedy of Macbeth? Did these exist? Oh yes, and they stood for a generation or so before they too sank into the bogs, fens and swamps that dominate East Albion and were abandoned. To be honest, it's a bit of a repeating cycle in my homeland that tends to go like this. The population of a successful tribe expands until it outgrows its old cave system and the fight for living space erupts once more. Normally at this point some uh, inventive soul will start to create buildings and the like and the tribe's settlement will expand beyond the caves. This will then continue until uh, disaster strikes. More often than not Disease rears its ugly head in the cramped conditions and decimates the population. Sometimes, though, a storm 
destroys all the tents and wooden buildings, or under the damp conditions that uh, prevail on the island, they simply rot away quicker than they can be repaired. Very occasionally, a settlement will be destroyed by a uh, bloodthirsty monster from the depths of the wilds, drawn to its prey by the uh, easy pickings that such flimsy structures provide. But this has not stopped some very impressive larger buildings from being constructed though, such as the castles built by King Dunko and his father in East Albion, being the uh, the most recent perhaps. They were apparently inspired by the uh, mysterious citadel of lead in the north, which the king's father had seen in his youth, but uh, more in this later. To be true though, this kind of innovation is rare. For the fate of each of these types of structures, too, is always the same. They always collapse under their own weight due to the uh, unstable earth beneath their foundations. And so, after the fall of each of these uh, stabs at civilization, everyone once more returns to the caves, chastened and swearing off the evils of progress. And the cycle starts again. Ah... Just as the old philosopher Rodbert of Ostland once said, Barbarism is the natural state of man. It is civilization that is unnatural and merely a whim of circumstance. That is why, ultimately, the barbarian will always triumph over the civilized. Oh, yeah, yeah. Typical Ostlander, so dour, so fatalistic. With uh, wise men such as that in the Empire, it is little wonder that we are at war with ourselves. Alas, you may be more right than you know. But, though we so, perhaps we should let the Master Alchemist continue before we become embroiled in a conversation we cannot easily extricate ourselves from, Master Tavern Keeper. Ah, yes, a very good point. There is much to discuss there, but now is not the time. Please, please, Cedric, continue. Ah, if you're sure, in that case I'll get back to Bola Hat. Here, the Albionites have once more begun their steady scramble up the muddy slope of civilization. As usual, the population had outgrown the complex cave system that honeycombed the crags in that area, and vicious fighting had broken out between rival families as each battled to secure the safest living space. This shortage led to one inspired inhabitant deciding that they would make their own abode away from the caves, and from there, sod huts and animal hide tents spread like mold and lichen over a fallen tree trunk. Anyhow, when we the entourage of the venerable truth sayer Marbin arrived at the northern outskirts of Bola Hat. It was, of course, raining. It is Albion, after all. Even during high summer, as it was then, it still rains most days. I'll never forget the approach, though. It was the smell that hit us first. The breeze was blowing from the south, and with it came the most peculiar mixture of odours. Primarily it was the... Uh, there was a smell of burnt wood and peat, but also sweat, cattle, urine, alcohol, and a plethora of other things I could not place. It was, uh, it was not pleasant. Soon after, the mist parted and revealed the bustling sprawl of Bola Hat. It was a strange sight, resembling fallen autumn leaves that had been swept up into a pile. The outskirts of the settlement were a tumble of small, disorganised tents and shacks that slowly became larger, more permanent structures, such as uh, roughly lashed together wooden inns, smithies, leather tent bakeries, numerous rickety windmills built in the hillocks that dot the land around there, and even a large tent made from animal bones and toughened hides that was a distillery making aqua vitae, as they call it down here in Tilia. The shanty town near the city were separated by timber toll houses along each roadside. Now, trade has become the norm in Bolahat. This is unusual, 
in Albion. Everyone is usually very self-sufficient, but such things are obviously uh, impossible in such a place as Bola Hat. Primarily, it is the barter of uh, meat for food and furs for maintaining the tents in exchange for uh, tools and weapons made by the uh, numerous blacksmiths that have taken up residency there. Trading like this is a uh, unfamiliar ground for many Albionites, and uh, this often leads to frustration and outbursts of violence, with merchants more often than not bludgeoning each other to death as opposed to uh, amicably exchanging goods. Such are our ways, though. Anyhow, at the very center of this bumpity bump metropolis were the largest tents, each resembling a gigantic upturned bowl. These belonged to the nobility and war leaders of Bolahat and were made of the best materials and constantly guarded by the hearth guard of the tribe. This trend to live in tents has uh, left the caves all but abandoned, though, with only traditionalists and outcasts now frequenting the chambers, which were once the lairs of uh, chieftains and princelings. On that particular day, it was to the actual chieftain of Bolahat that we were headed. It is expected that each truthsayer that passes through the city pay their respects to the ruler of Bolahat, the uh, Unger Ur, meaning something like a big woman in Reichspiel. The Unger Ur at the time was a Kautimandua. She was actually having a rough time with it back then, having fallen out of favour with a number of her nobles after divorcing her popular long-time husband, Venet, and marrying his handsome armour-bearer, Velakat, with the former fleeing into exile soon after. But uh, this was not the end of that particular story, as we were soon to see. We eventually came to the outskirts of the city. The tracks leading into it were treacherous and boggy, covered in thick, stodgy, muddy puddles, some coming up to your knee. Chasak and I had uh, already cajoled our charge, the white hog, Torque, into his conveyance to uh, avoid the mud, and were leading a troop of men and women in pushing and dragging the wagon through it, but uh, with limited progress. Ahead, the venerable Marvin, too, was uh, having similar trouble in his chariot, as the sucking mud clogged up its wheels and brought us all to a standstill. This was exactly what some of the residents of Bola had been waiting for, though. And as we struggled there, neither able to go forwards nor backwards, a flock of grey uh, columns swooped down on us to settle on our shoulders and heads, with those that could not fit perching on the nearby tents and the two stone hog statues that sat either side of the road. What? More birds? But uh, these birds are not the same as the uh, sea crows from Og Agog, are they? Ach, oh, no. These are, er, uh, um... Actually, I forget the name in Reichspiel. But they're used to carry messages over in your empire. Ah, I think you mean pigeons. Homing pigeons. Ach, oh, yes, that's it. That's the word. Although, it's not just messages. Well, now it's at the University of Nuln. Professor Johann Veit, the Elder... A descendant of the school's founder, Sebastian Veit, had been experimenting with training some of them to carry small balls of black powder to drop on the enemy. But, uh, well, with little real results. Apart from a lot of uh, burnt birds and blowing off his own right leg. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. I've seen the uh, Skaven try such weapons with similar success. When we rescued the guild master, Aulik Rinkeldraz, one of them tried to lob an exploding gaseous glass ball at us, but uh, it uh, shattered over his head, and after the green miasma had cleared, all that was left was a dead rat who'd drowned in his own blood. <laughs> and good riddance. But anyway, sorry, Cedric. Please continue. Ach, thank you. Well, normally we Albionites take great delight in their coming, 
as they're considered quite the delicacy. But at this very moment, they were simply a great irritation, flapping this way and that, and uh, cooing incessantly. But as quickly as they had come, they fled, as a familiar roar echoed out over the tent city. Bollocks! I looked towards the old booming voice and saw the giant, mighty bollocks, lumbering through the tents, randomly grabbing ones that took his fancy by the roost and flinging the tent covering into the air to reveal what was within. It appeared to be fun to him. When he found food, he wolfed it down. When he found something shiny, he shoved it down his trousers. But if he saw something he didn't like, well, he'd yell and bawl and then jump up and down on it. And as we stood there, transfixed by the sight, a stream of young men and women flew past us, screaming in a panic. For you see, Bowler Hat has many more young people than many places in Albion, due to its uh, fast-paced lifestyle and opportunities for novel experiences. But uh, this means that uh, many were not used to seeing a giant running rampant. I managed to grab one by the arm and demanded to know what was going on. He looked me in the eye and the words tumbled out of his mouth like lemmings off a cliff edge. It's the former chief Renard. He's brought the giants down upon us. He wants revenge against his former wife, the Onga Ur. And as I looked, I could see men carrying long poles onto which large slabs of meat had been attached trying to entice Bollocks away from his game of uh, whip the roof off the tent and towards the centre of the settlement, the seat of the Unger Ur. I turned back to the man and asked, Oi, you said giants. I can only see mighty Bollocks. But before he could say any more, I got my answer as another voice boomed out across Bowler Hat. <laughs> I peered towards its source, but I couldn't see anything through the smoke and mist. The man I'd been questioning took the opportunity to slip my grasp and rejoin the fleeing mob. It didn't matter though, for all at once all my questions were answered as out stepped the infamous drunken giant, Markle Grimmock, the bane of Durgle Hill. He too was surrounded by a gang of men, although these carried kegs of mead instead of meat. The giant was staggering about, clearly intoxicated, indiscriminately swinging his horn-topped club around, killing anyone within reach and obliviously trampling the tents and their occupants underfoot. So, it was no hyperbole in the play. Markle Grimmock really is as drunken as he was portrayed. Ach, you don't know the half of it. The tales of his drunken antics are widely told. There was a time he got stinking drunk and knocked over an entire henge, leading to a storm of magic, wreaking havoc over Muddy Point and causing giant crabs to rain down all over the country. Another time, he passed out on a beach up north, only to awake to find himself being dragged out to sea by a hungry mirrorworm. The worm uh, didn't last long after that, though. And finally, we have the tale of him getting roaring drunk and having his wicked way with the cattle of Cooley, something uh, best not gotten into too deeply. Suffice to say, although most of the cows made a full recovery, the great bull Whitehorn still walks a bit funny. Anyhow, upon seeing the pair of giants rampaging through Bola Hat, the venerable Marvin immediately summoned his two best giant whisperers forth, the venerable Chengus the Younger, and my own mentor, the venerable Bede. He sent Chengus to deal with Bollocks. The family of this particular truthsayer had had a long history with old Bollocks, both his great-grandfather, Hengus the Elder, and his own grandfather, Hengus the Younger, had accompanied Bollocks on numerous adventures up in the Beast Peaks, and it was his own father, Chengus the Elder, that had witnessed Bollock's fight against the sea monster 
Grabadil, up on Giant's Causeway. His son, too, another Hengus, I was training to be a truth sayer, but uh, was a couple of years younger than me, so I didn't really know him. The other truth sayer was my own mentor, the Venerable Bede, a renowned giant speaker. It was he that had uh, finally diffused the feud between the brothers Dong and Kaktor a few years earlier. He was also a dear friend, as well as my teacher. At the Venerable Marvin's command, he raced to my side, embraced me, and whispered in my ear, I trust you. Whatever you choose, I know it'll be the right decision. It was the last thing he ever said to me. With that, he held up his staff of light and began to march towards Markle Grimmock. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Chengus do the same as he approached Bollocks. Although I couldn't hear it over the screaming crowds still fleeing, I knew each was chanting, and I saw both their staffs light up in unison. Suddenly, the two giants became still and docile. The old chieftain Venet's men also stopped and drew their weapons, but on seeing the two truth sayers, sheathed them again and faded away into the morass of people. No Albionite would knowingly dare raise a hand against the truth sayer. I then saw both the venerable Chengris and the venerable Bede begin to lead the pair of giants away from Bolahat. Bollogs off to the west and Markle off to the east. I never saw either of the men nor the giants again. Once the two giant whisperers and the charges were out of sight, the venerable Marvin addressed the remainder of his entourage. We were never here, and we never saw anything. Now get me to Og a Gog. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get Tork's conveyance and the venerable Marvin's chariot out of the mud, though. And so, my fellow student, Merchard, conjured up some fire and incinerated them both, whilst the rest of us prepared to uh, circumvent Bolahat and rejoin the Lost Road south. My goodness, the more I hear about these giants of yours, the more they intrigue me. But uh, there is one thing that intrigues me yet more. What is this tragedy of Macdes you both keep referring to. I know the name, but I do not know the story, I'm afraid. Ah, well, that must be remedied. But, Master Tavernkeeper, do you hold on to your horses there for a moment? Before you recite the entire scripts of both players, why don't I go on better and give you both the full story of King Dunko and his uh, murderer, the vicious Macdeath, as it happened in reality? Oh, but what? Really? You know it? This is a special occasion indeed. In that case, I think it's time to break out a few bottles of the seasonal mulled wine. Raid the taverns, stash of cheese, oh, and a fruit cake, and make ourselves comfortable. Just a few moments, please, gentlemen.